All right, thanks everyone for coming out tonight to Liberty Me You. Tonight we'll be talking to Ilya Shapiro about the unconstitutionality of o Obamacare. Ilya is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute, the editor of Cato's Supreme Court Review, the coordinator of Cato's Amicus Brief Program, and he's the co-author with uh, PJ O'Rourke of the funniest Amicus Brief that I have ever read, probably the funniest one ever. I'll link it in chat in just a minute. Uh, and he swore on the Constitution at his wedding, so he is serious about this stuff. Uh, so without further ado, Ilya Shafir. To be clear, uh, I, I, I wrote that brief with my colleagues Trevor Burris and Gabe Latner, and PJ approved it. So when you read that brief, um, if you consider it to be PJ or quality, uh, we certainly appreciate it. Um, uh, but that was all us. And we're very happy that PJ joined us. Okay, um, so we're here to talk about um, legal and constitutional challenges to Obamacare. Um, this is my first time on uh, liberty.me, uh, so we'll see how this goes. Um, if any of you are interested in the previous uh, lawsuits, constitutional challenges to Obamacare, uh, the case that ended up being NFIB versus Sebelius, um, uh, you know, Cato, myself, lots of other people have, Randy Barnett, Tim Sandifer, uh, lots of people have written about that. My law review article kind of analyzing Chief Justice Roberts' deviation from uh, uh, the proper role of a judge, I suppose, is called um, Like Eastwood Talking to a Chair. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of the Obamacare Ruling. That was in the Texas Review of Law and Politics. But I don't want to talk about that case right now. You're welcome to ask me about it in the questions, I suppose. Uh, we are now focused on the litigation involving Obamacare since the Supreme Court ruled uh, in June 2012 uh, to transform the individual mandate into a tax and thereby approve it. Uh, and then to strike down the requirement that states expand their Medicaid, um, which has uh, caused only about half the country, half the states, to expand uh, Medicaid. So uh, there are a number of different kinds of legal challenges um, currently pending before various courts at, at, at different levels um, of the trial process, of the litigation process. Um, one series of cases involves the origination clause. That is, uh, if the individual mandate isn't a mandate, it's a tax, uh, and Chief Justice Roberts said it was, well then, uh, there's a constitutional requirement that all bills to raise revenue uh, have to originate in the House. And what happened with Obamacare was that Harry Reid, who then, as now, was the Senate Majority Leader, took uh, a bill from the, that the House had passed relating to um, housing credits for veterans, stripped the bill of everything except its number, uh, and replaced it with Obamacare. So uh, if that satisfies the origination clause, then anything satisfies the origination clause, and um, it's, it's not an enforceable part of the Constitution. Uh, Randy Barnett has uh, blogged about this at the Bullock Conspiracy. Uh, others have as well. Uh, there's, there are a number of cases making this particular point. Uh, Tim Sandifer for Pacific Legal Foundation, also an adjunct scholar at Cato, is the lead attorney in CISL versus Health and Human Services. Um, that was argued at the D.C. Circuit about a month and a half ago. Uh, it was a very unfortunate draw in terms of the panel on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, two of them were Obama appointees. Um, uh, the, the, the argument, I mean, the, you know, from a uh, true constitutionalist perspective, it's kind of a slam dunk uh, sort of argument. Uh, but in that court, uh, Tim faced very strong headwinds uh, against him. 
and indeed, the, that panel might decide it on standing grounds. They, there were some questions about whether Matt Sissel, the named plaintiff, uh, is even still uh, legally able to challenge that provision, given that he's an Army reservist, and he, at the time of the argument, was serving uh, in Afghanistan uh, and getting health care from uh, the U.S. government uh, during that service. But uh, again, he, uh, in his personal capacity as an individual, an entrepreneur, an artist, uh, he uh, uh, does not want to get the health care. He feels that the, 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 the Obamacare tax violates his rights and um, uh, uh, therefore has a plausible claim uh, uh, regarding the origination clause. There's another case called uh, Holtzky that uh, raises the same sort of issue. So that's, that's one line of attack. Um, another one filed by uh, Cato's friends at the Goldwater Institute uh, in Phoenix, in Arizona, uh, involves a challenge to the Individual Payment Advisory Board, IPAP. Um, this is an agency, this is what uh, Sarah Palin had called death panels in her time. This is a, a board uh, that is uh, supposed to determine what the reimbursement rates for various types of procedures are and whether it is worth it for the government to pay for certain types of medical procedures uh, for certain patients. Um, and this board is independent of the three branches of government. Uh, it, it, uh, legislates, it, it, it creates what procedures should be covered, uh, it, it executes that particular law, it adjudicates, it's this kind of freestanding branch of government that, by the way, the way that Obamacare is written can only be repealed during a brief period in 2017 by a supermajority of the Senate. Um, this case is bogged down in a, in a host of uh, procedural issues, and it's now before the Ninth Circuit. Christina Sandifer, uh, the wife of Tim Sandifer, uh, is arguing, has argued that case at the Ninth Circuit, and we're waiting for a ruling. Uh, it's kind of been on a slow burn, uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, the Weekly Standard a couple of years ago had a very good article about this challenge to iPad and the constitutional defects to it. Uh, I don't have handy the name of it uh, or anything like that, but if you Google you know, IPAB challenge, weekly standard, there was a very good article uh, about that. Now, now we come to uh, the implementation of Obamacare, not Obamacare as it's written and constitutional defects with the text as such, uh, but how it's been implemented. One of the biggest defects was identified by my colleague at Cato, Michael Cannon, who's not a lawyer, but a uh, health care policy scholar, uh, and John Adler, who is a law professor at Case Western University and on the board of the advisory board of the Cato Supreme Court Review. And they found uh, that um, the subsidies that are in place in Obamacare to help people by uh, Obamacare compliant policies only go to people in states, citizens in states, that set up their own exchanges. That is, if you've read enough about Obamacare, you know that uh, the law cannot require states to set up exchanges. Uh, that would violate the constitutional prohibition on federal commandeering of the states. That's a legal term. It means that the federal government can't force states to do its bidding. Uh, what the law says, what the Affordable Care Act says, is that if a state does not set up an exchange, a marketplace, um, this uh, mechanism by which different insurance companies can compete for the business of those states um, would be insured, um, then the federal government will do it. But the way that the text of the Affordable Care Act is written, it says that only uh, citizens of states that set up these exchanges are eligible for subsidies. Moreover, employers who don't comply with the employer mandate 
that is they have employees who have to go on the market and uh, get their own get their own insurance policies and are eligible for these subsidies are penalized based on the number of employees who get these subsidies and so a number of these employers along with employees in or, or individuals in states that have not created the Obamacare exchanges are suing the IRS. This is not now the Health and Human Services Department or Kathleen Sebelius, now a, a new uh, Secretary for human, Health and Human Services. But the IRS uh, wrote a rule, promulgated a rule, saying that we'll just ignore that part of the Affordable Care Act's text uh, that says that subsidies, tax credits, only go to people in states that have set up their own exchanges. As it turns out, only 16 or 15 or 14 now, depending on how you count the states with exchanges. These exchanges have been failing. I think we're down to about 14 states now with viable exchanges. Um, but the IRS says that even in those states, the majority, uh, that have subsidies for uh, people to buy their Obamacare policies, um, uh, th th that they get these subsidies. And so there are at least four that I'm aware of lawsuits challenging the provision of these tax credits, these subsidies, to people um, buying uh, Obamacare policies um, uh, in states that have not set up their own exchanges. There have been a couple of arguments, again, based on the way that President Obama has stacked the uh, circuit courts of appeal that have not been very favorable in the D.C. and Fourth Circuit, for example. The Fourth Circuit covers uh, Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Maryland, uh, and North Carolina, uh, and uh, in South Carolina, sorry. And there are another couple of lawsuits that are still pending. If one of those is decided against the government, uh, then the Supreme Court will have to take that case. This this line of argumentation, this area of litigation, has been covered. There's the, the Hallbig case in the D.C. Circuit, the King case in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, Oklahoma itself is, has filed in the, in the Tenth Circuit. Um, the, the media has covered these cases. They've said that they're a serious challenge to Obamacare, uh, but they've said that there's not much chance of succeeding. We will see. I mean, these are all active cases. There has not yet been a ru ruling uh, in these cases. And finally, the other type of case that I want to raise is uh, or are challenges to President Obama's delays, exemptions, waivers uh, of various kinds of people or various provisions of the text of the Affordable Care Act. So whether it's the employer mandate or the requirement um, that uh, policies be capped uh, at, at a certain amount of out-of-pocket costs per year uh, and per lifetime, uh, or that uh, uh, the requirements that are, Obamacare's requirements that policy eligible policies cover a whole host of procedures, uh, conditions, etc., uh, that have thrown people out of their existing policies. You know, this is the lie that Obama, that, that the President Obama made, that if you like your policy, you'll keep it. All of these provisions have been delayed, uh, kicked down the road until the 2016 election, basically, uh, at certain periods during 2016. Um, 38 times the executive branch, whether the President himself or Health and Human Services or the IRS, uh, have delayed various provisions of Obamacare from going into effect. Uh, and these sorts of executive actions, it's very hard to find someone who has standing to challenge them because the delay or the waiver or the exemptions help people rather than hurting them. Indeed, if President Obama tomorrow said he was waiving all of Obamacare, that would obviously be a good thing for the country as a whole, and it would be hard to find a plaintiff who was hurt by that action. I suppose some 25, 26 year olds that are no longer eligible for their parents' policies, or maybe someone who has a pre existing condition that wasn't covered, although there are different ways of covering that under existing state risk pools. But nevertheless, the issue is 
fees, delays, and exemptions and waivers, it's hard to find someone who has standing. And therefore, if you've been following the news this week, Speaker of the House John Boehner has announced that he will be pursuing uh, a House lawsuit against the president, against the executive branch, saying that the executive branch has infringed on the legislative branch's prerogatives on its institutional interest uh, in the Constitution's separation of powers by suspending the law, by rewriting the law, not just in the Obamacare context. There's uh, immigration laws, there are FDA, Food and Drug Administration laws, EPA, environmental regulations, uh, a whole host of ways in which this uh, executive has either declined to enforce the law or rewritten the law and taken certain actions uh, that it's hard to find a plaintiff for. Now, this is a novel legal theory on the standing point. Uh, the idea that the House, or perhaps later this fall, if and when the Republicans take control of the Senate, the Senate might join the House in suing the President, in suing the executive branch for violating its duty to take care of the laws be faithfully executed. Um, it's novel, it's unprecedented, um, uh, but given the unprecedented nature of the executive branch's violations, uh, again, where it's, it's hard to find a plaintiff, um, you know, previous presidents have certainly done things that have violated the Constitution, but people have been hurt by that. Uh, here, it's kind of speculative, let's say, uh, with uh, the delay or the, um, the deferred action uh, policy of this administration with respect to the DREAMers uh, with immigration law. I and Cato, we think uh, the border should be open more. You should have a wide gate and a high wall. People that are here that aren't committing crimes, uh, that aren't sitting on welfare, should be able to be here and be productive members of society. Congress hasn't passed such a law, unfortunately, uh, but the president has created one uh, by himself with respect to people that have been brought to this country uh, as infants, as children, and have been not just allowed to stay, their deportations have been delayed, uh, but there's been a, a, a sort of green card created for them, a, a status created for them by this administration in violation of uh, what the legislature actually says. So again, it, it's hard to see who is hurt by that. Um, there's a very kind of tendentious link, let's say, uh, somebody is uh, killed or, or defrauded or otherwise hurt in some way by someone that, that uh, uh, benefits from this deferred action plan by one of these uh, dreamers. In normal law, uh, that is that does not suffice to satisfy the causation standard for finding standing. Or, excuse me for being a little legalese on this point. But anyhow, in, in, in this and other circumstances, uh, Speaker Boehner uh, in the House uh, plans to sue in their institutional capacity because the president is infringing on, uh, on the legislature. No idea whether something like this could survive a legal challenge. Uh, again, it's unprecedented, it's novel, it's appealing. Um, you know, no, of leading legal scholars and academics, nobody gave the individual mandate challenge uh, a chance whatsoever. Leading scholars, leading uh, commentators were calling it frivolous uh, back in the day in 2010 when it was filed. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we don't even know what the specifics uh, of this particular challenge are, what the executive actions are that are, that are being challenged. So that's a broad overview uh, of the different types of cases that are being brought, that, that, that can be brought. Uh, Any time there is a major piece of social legislation, uh, it's a lawyer full employment act. So whether we were talking about Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, those types of major pieces of legislation uh, produce litigation for decades. Uh, so we have not at all seen the last of litigation challenging Obamacare some of it going to the text of the Affordable Care Act, some of it going to the implementation, some of it we won't really know about. And Nancy Pelosi is right. This 
thing is such a monstrosity that we won't really know what's in it or how it violates the Constitution or other federal laws until it gets implemented in certain kinds of ways. Um, so stay tuned for that. But uh, I think I've, I've presented a, a wide range of uh, the situation at hand. Uh, and I'm, I welcome your comments and questions uh, as to uh, uh, what you think or what you wonder is going on with this law. I, I will give a caveat that I'm not a health care scholar or lawyer. I'm a constitutional lawyer. So I'm sure that in the thousands of pages of regulations of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, of the IRS, and other agencies, there are problems with how this law is being administered or there might be conflicts between these rules uh, and the text of the statute. I am uh, not by any means equipped to answer all of those questions, but certainly the law as written is problematic as a, as, as a matter of constitutional law. And even as, a, as, as the law has been rewritten by John Roberts, uh, has also introduced uh, a level of complexity and, and constitutional defect. So I'll leave it there, uh, and I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the first question that comes to mind for me, you know, oh, would all of these challenges, if if they went to the Supreme Court and things went well for us, um, would all of these be killing blows to the bill? Or not all of them. Right, right. Um, the, 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 the IRS rule challenge, Halbig and King, this tax credit subsidy uh, going to people in states where exchanges have not been set up by the state, um, that would be pretty fatal politically in the sense that uh, if those subsidies were struck down, then Congress would have to reopen the law because very few people would be getting subsidies, very few people would be buying the insurance, uh, the whole structure of the healthcare system as envisioned by Obamacare would fail. Uh, the origination clause would be not a political uh, fatal blow, but a legal fatal blow because if that's struck down, then effectively the law is struck down. Uh, because remember, uh, the individual mandate and the, the provisions that are related to it were only upheld uh, as rewritten by Chief Justice Roberts as a tax. So if that tax is struck down as violating the origination clause, um, then Congress has to go down back to the drawing board. I didn't even mention the case that the Supreme Court is about to decide, possibly tomorrow, if not tomorrow, then Monday, about the contraceptive mandate. Hobby Lobby is the case, the, the requirement um, that uh, certain contraceptives that people object to on, on religious grounds be covered uh, by employers subject to the employer mandate. That, is, that certainly would not be a fatal blow at all. It would be important in terms of religious liberties and constitutional rights and so forth, uh, but, but it wouldn't uh, wound Obamacare per se. So there, there are different, uh, you know, each of these has to be taken on its own terms. Uh, some of them would be fatal to the law as a whole, as a, whole, as a legal matter. Some of them would be uh, uh, politically very difficult, requiring Congress, forcing Congress's hand to reopen the law. Um, and some of them would knock out certain parts uh, of the law, which would be high profile in the news, but wouldn't necessarily affect the structure and the func functioning of Obamacare more broadly. Now, um, actually, we've got a, a question from the audience here uh, from Andrew. Uh, read the individual mandate ruling. Did the Supreme Court set a precedent that any action can be coerced as long as the penalty is monetary? Um, in fact, Chief Justice Roberts said that as long as there is no coercion, it's okay. This has to be a tax. It cannot coerce behavior. And so paradoxically, if Congress were to raise the tax that one now has to pay for not buying health insurance, it would be unconstitutional on the face of the decision that Chief Justice Roberts wrote. That is, 
uh, this year, the first year that the individual mandate is supposed to go into effect, the penalty, sorry, not the penalty, the tax, the tax, um, that one has to pay for choosing not to buy health insurance is $95. And it goes up over the course of several years up to a maximum of, I believe it's $600 or $900. That is all less than the cost of the cheapest health insurance plan. So rationally, logically, a lot of people will be paying that so-called tax rather than actually buying the insurance. Uh, which forces Obamacare to break down in a certain extent. You know, in terms of the money flowing from people, it's, it's supposed to make sure that people are indeed covered and paying into the system at a level that their risk premium, you know, you know the, the way that the underwriting works, it doesn't work very well if not everybody buys insurance. So let's say Congress wisens up to that and wants to raise... Uh, the cost of the tax to one dollar more than the cost of the cheapest uh, Obamacare compliant insurance policy around. According to the face, the, the, the literal text of Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in F NFIB versus Sebelius, that would be unconstitutional because it would be coercive, it would be compulsive. Um, it's constitutional, the individual mandate is constitutional as a tax because it's not coercive gives people a choice. Buy a policy or pay this relatively small tax. That's one of the paradoxes uh, and incongruities uh, in the, uh, the ruling that the Supreme Court made two years ago. Now I've heard uh, some political commentators on the right say that really uh, in deciding that it was a tax instead of upholding it as a penalty, uh, Roberts did the right a favor. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, there were some people that saying it would generate uh, turnout to elevate Mitt Romney to the presidency. Obviously, that failed. Um, I, I mean, I generally think that if you uh, uh, want to win a case, if you think that uh, you know, your side is correct, it's better to win that case than to lose that case. Um, there are some who, on the right, who applaud Roberts for his judicial restraint in bending over backwards to uphold the law and pass it to the voters to decide ultimately uh, whether this is something, whether, whether this is an exercise of federal authority that they want to approve. Um, I disagree with that. I think that the job of the Supreme Court or the federal judiciary in general is not to bend over backwards to uphold a law and to allow the voters to vote out of office people that pass that law if they don't like it, but it's to hold um, government's feet to the fire, to the constitutional fire. Uh, and if they think it's beyond Congress's power, they should say so. Um, I, you know, I don't think Roberts did... Um, libertarians or conservatives any favors. Uh, I think part of the reason for his ruling, this idea of judicial restraint, uh, goes against the proper role of a judge. Um, we, we shouldn't be wanting judges to just defer to the legislative and, and executive branches, to the political branches. We want them to be reviewing legislation um, against the Constitution and let the chips fall where they may. And when we can have an argument about the proper uh, constitutional power of the federal government, um, uh, rather than saying, well, this judge is too activist versus this judge is, too, is, is restrained, uh, I think that's the right, wrong way of seeing it. My, my colleagues, my friends at the Institute for Justice call this judicial engagement. Um, I mean, whatever you call it, I think the proper role of an Article III judge, of a federal judge, uh, is when presented with a challenge, a constitutional challenge to a piece of federal legislation, uh, is to see whether indeed the federal government has the power to do that uh, and not to apply a presumption of constitutionality. I mean, I wouldn't presume that everything Congress does is constitutional because most congressmen don't presume that. They sort of kick the can down the road and they'll vote for something and wait for the courts to decide whether it's constitutional or not. We, we should not want to have a system of 
double deference, um, where Congress or the legislature in the state context defers, you know, passes something and defers to courts on whether uh, it's constitutional or not, and the courts in turn say, well, if Congress or the legislature passed it, uh, it must be constitutional on, on some justification. We, you know, we might be able to come up with something. That, I think that's the wrong way around. Each branch should should have to should be forced uh, to decide whether something is constitutional or not. All right, Andrew asks, uh, didn't this ruling insulate Congress politically since they didn't even have to call the penalty a tax? That's right. That's part of the problem with uh, Chief Justice Roberts' ruling. The taxing power, the federal taxing power under the Constitution, is actually more broad than the power to regulate interstate commerce. Um, but there's a greater political check on it. So what Roberts did uh, was to allow um, Obamacare to run the easier political gauntlet in calling itself a regulation of interstate commerce, and then the easier legal or constitutional gauntlet in coming under the taxing power. Um, it's unclear whether any law ever in future uh, will be able to satisfy that, but certainly in this particular case, uh, Chief Justice Roberts and the Supreme Court allowed Congress to evade political accountability. Uh, when I was in uh, constitutional law and in, in law school, my professor was uh, Narissa Smith, who you, uh, who you uh, debated on gun control this spring. Uh, I brought up the origination clause uh, challenge, and she called it nitpicking. Uh, what is the sort of the mood among constitutional scholars? I mean, to me, it seems like a slam dunk constitutional case. I mean, the origination clause, which uh, for those in the audience uh, who might not know, that's that means that uh, every uh, tax has to start in in the house. Uh, it seems like it's a clear cut violation of the origination clause. The origination clause was there not as some kind of arbitrary provision. Um, the founders saw the house as the people's house. And the power to tax is the biggest power that the federal government has. And so you, the, the framers wanted it to reside in um, the branch of government in the, in the House of Congress that was most accountable to the people. Uh, you know, congressmen being subject to election every two years, um, and being directly elected. Or originally, of course, the Senate was elected by the, uh, by the state legislatures. Uh, and so that was a very important provision. It was, it was the subject of a, of a grand compromise. Um, but more broadly, uh, if, if we say that this or any other part of the Constitution is mere nitpicking or a technicality, then we're saying the words on the constitutional text don't matter. We can just decide what's right, given our own impressions of what makes good policy, or, or what is not frivolous, or what is not uh, nitpicking. Uh, at that point, we uh, unmoor the government from any sense of the rule of law. Uh, we, we decide that government is in the hands of um, people that we elect or that we appoint uh, based on their wisdom, uh, and they can do what they think is, is correct or best for the country. The reason that we care about constitutionalism is because that is supposed to be a higher law. Uh, the, the government itself is supposed to be bound, it's supposed to be restricted within certain limits. Uh, and if the people decide that those limits just don't work anymore, there's a constitutional amendment process to add powers or otherwise change the constitution. So even if there was something uh, you know, that turns out to be very stupid in the modern context in the existing Constitution. 
judges uh, are duty bound to apply that quote unquote stupid provision unless it's um, changed through the amendment process. All right, I'm going to put out a last call for questions from the audience, and I'll ask uh, a question with a, a slightly larger scope. As a constitutionalist, uh, looking back at, at the history of jurisprudence in the United States, do you think that the Constitution has been a successful uh, limit to the growth of government? More successful than anywhere else. Um, you know, it's, it's better that we have this constitution than, than, than we don't. In, in Britain, there is no written constitution, and yet their sense of constitutionalism is stronger than in most countries in the world. Uh, but because they don't have this written constitution, uh, they have been overrun increasingly in the past decades uh, by the diktats of the European Union. Um, the United States uh, uh, still, uh, even uh, judges and justices, academics that don't agree with the limitations on federal power have to somehow fit uh, their views into the rubric that, that we've created. And you know, it's taken 70 years to pervert uh, federal power, to expand federal power in a way that perverts the Constitution. Um, and there's still a, a, a hearty resistance to that sort of movement. Um, people ask me a lot, uh, what kind of constitutional amendments would you suggest uh, to rein in the power of the federal government? Uh, and I advise different types of organizations that propose uh, constitutional amendments. For example, the Compact for America, using the interstate compact mechanism to put in a balanced budget amendment to force Congress's hand um, once enough states have already agreed on that. Um, you know, I'm kind of an all of the above kind of guy. I, I, I do think that you know, Randy Barnett has proposed the Federalism Amendment that's, that's if enough, enough states agree, they can reject or nullify federal law. Valve's budget is a good idea. I mean, there's uh, term limits. Lo lots of different uh, ideas that I'm in favor of. Um, unfortunately, I think that uh, really the, the, the most, I mean, what we really need is, after every sentence or clause in the Constitution, is to add the phrase, and we mean it. Because if you interpret the Constitution based on what the text actually says, rather than bending over backwards to approve um, plainly extra-constitutional uses of federal power, um, then we'd be where we need to be. And if people want to expand federal power, for example, uh, Social Security is plainly unconstitutional. The idea that the federal government can uh, create people's pensions, and that sort of thing, might be a good idea. Social Security is hugely popular, but it would be an advance in the rule of law in this country uh, if we were, without changing the policy at all, to uh, accept a constitutional amendment to allow Social Security. At least then, the legislation would match what Congress is actually allowed to do. Uh, and so, um, I, I certainly advocate a much more robust role uh, for the courts. Not that I care, you know, I, I envision judicial imperialism um, by Justice Kennedy or anyone else to just uh, put in their view of what the government should do. Uh, but I think if the courts were more vigilant in policing the Constitution, uh, then the political branches uh, would be more responsive to that and we would have more of the sort of dynamic um, that was set out in the republic the framers created. Great answer. Um, Brad Moore asks, what impact do you think the ACA will have on immigration policy, if any? It's hard to disaggregate that. 
Um, you know, we, uh, the last few weeks we've had reports of um, illegal children, minors, uh, being sent from Central America to this country uh, because they apparently think that the DREAM Act uh, will be passed or to take advantage of the executive DREAM Act that Obama has um, illegally uh, enacted in effect. Um, illegal immigrants are not eligible for welfare. They're not eligible for public programs. Um, you know, they, they can get treatment at emergency rooms and their kids can go to public schools. That is the extent, I mean, that's, that's not insignificant, especially in the border states and counties, we have to recognize that. Uh, but illegal immigrants simply are not uh, accessing uh, the welfare state. And Obamacare itself, the Affordable Care Act itself, uh, exempts illegal aliens from its requirements and provisions. Um, so I don't know what kind of misinformation there might be uh, in Mexico and Central America, the font of uh, illegal immigrants in this country, uh, with regard to health care. That, that's generally not why people come to this country. They come because there's more economic opportunity than there is uh, in, in their places of origin. Uh, I myself just became a U.S. citizen this past Friday, by the way. I was born in Russia and naturalized as a Canadian when I was little. Uh, and, and, and finally, I'm, I'm here, and the, you know, the, the whole issue of the immigration system and how it doesn't serve anybody's interests uh, is, a, is a much broader discussion. But Obamacare and immigration, I'm not sure uh, there's much correlation there. Um, you know, to the extent that it attracts more people because they think that they can get more benefits, um, that's legally false. Um, and to the extent that it uh, uh, affects the public policy debate or the willingness of, of people to open borders to people who aren't committing uh, uh, crimes and, and, and what are, are sitting on welfare or what have you, uh, then the solution is, is what President Reagan's uh, uh, chief of uh, his Council of Economic Advisors, Bill Niskanen, uh, has long said, the, the, the late chairman of, of Cato, he always said, put a wall around the welfare state, not around the country, because we want people who are economically productive, who are here to be um, uh, productive members of society. And by the way, they come here just for that. They don't come here to vote on or serve on juries, um, which are the only things, or sit on welfare, which are the only things that uh, the difference between citizenship and uh, and a green card and, and being able to work here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a great overview of, of the challenges to Obamacare. Some of them I hadn't even heard of and I tried to keep up on this. Uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and we'll be paying attention as these things go forward. Um, our next uh, session in Liberty Me U is going to be on Friday night. It's an authors forum with Carl Watner, who is the editor of the Voluntarist uh, newsletter. He's uh, we're releasing for members uh, the Essential Voluntarist, which is an edited collection of his work, and he's going to be here with us on Friday night at 8 p.m. So if you're interested, definitely join us for that. Uh, thanks everyone for coming, and thank you so much. <laughs>